he can begin. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the August 16th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Wash, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Wash, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Actually, um, Ms. Rowe, it's Ms. Glazer. I sent you a revised uh, script. I do apologize. Oh, uh, I'm but we've sorry. had a, a change in staff. So Ms. Glazer will be taking uh, the role this afternoon. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try to get that right. So Ms. Glazer, will you please call the roll? Good afternoon. Um, Ms. Causey? Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Hen? Present. Ms. Hassan? And Ms. Rowe? Present. Thank you. Ms. Glazer, will you please call the role of staff present? So the only staff members present may are the um, the law office staff. So that would be oh, okay. me, Ms. Ms. Wash, and uh, Ms. Glazer, as I said, is helping out in, um, uh, given the fact that this is Ms. Wash's first PRC meeting. Okay, great. So um, I guess we'll start with unfinished business then, policy 8315, meetings, participation by the public, and, and update on litigation, Ms. Howie. Thank you. Members of the committee, um, you may recall that in March of 2001, uh, the board committed to PRC policy 8315, which is your policy that lays out the stakeholder groups uh, who speak at your board meetings. Uh, as a result of not recognizing one group as a stakeholder, there was a request made of the State Board of Education to declare this group a stakeholder under policy 8315. That request went to the State Board of Education in April of 21. In July of 21, the State Board issued order 2106 um, declining jurisdiction. After a motion for reconsideration, the State Board issued Order 2109. That was in September of 2021, ag again declining jurisdiction. An appeal was noted to Circuit Court. Uh, there was a hearing before Judge Ballou Watts on May 4, 2022. Uh, to date, there has been no decision issued from the circuit court. So at this point, 8315, even though it was returned to you for review in the 2021 school year, uh, and again in limbo in the 21 or 2122 school year, is still uh, not right to be considered based on outstanding litigation. As soon as we receive an opinion, we'll know whether or not we need to change and then we'll be free to go forward to change. I'm available to answer any questions. Committee members, are there any questions? Okay, hearing none, we will move on. 
to the next agenda item. Appeals and hearings Madam handbook. Chair. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Ms. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so currently under policy 8315. How are new? Stakeholder groups evaluated for consideration by the board to be included. Currently, there is no uh, method for evaluating how any group will be considered to be a stakeholder or any new group, I should say. Uh, the policy indicates that only groups extant believe it was as of the 1819 school year will be considered a stakeholder group. So that was one of the questions that was to be considered by you or by the committee when the policy was to come back to be considered. Thank you for that. I would um, think it's appropriate to ask uh, PRC staff to review other Maryland LEAs and see how they include stakeholder groups or do not include stakeholder groups, or um, if there is not a similar stakeholder group status used in other LEAs to uh, recommend a process uh, whereby the board could review and um, determine whether new stakeholder groups uh, should be included. I think if um, it's been clearly demonstrated during the COVID pandemic that uh, organizations, including our school board, need to be uh, ready to adapt uh, and that there are things that were not previously issues that quickly became very important issues. So certainly we would want our stakeholder group uh, to, to be um, changed, to be modified. So I'm curious if other um, PRC board members uh, would consider making that request also. So I think um, if I understand what you're asking for, it might be that the best way to do that is eventually this policy is going to be reviewed once litigation is um, complete and the consideration of the outcome of litigation um, along with what is the process for determining who is and is not a stakeholder and what criteria do they have to meet that that would be part of the policy that we'd be reviewing would it not miss howie yes ma'am so could um if no one objects could staff prepare that analysis and research um for when that policy comes to the committee surely so that way we can have that information. Thank you, Ms. Rowe, for that follow up. I guess my question is why do we need to wait for litigation that's been over a year in in the work so far? Because we don't know what the court is going to tell us we, that might impact what the policy says. Madam Chair. Yes, Julie. Yes, I concur with um, your statement. Um, that's part of policy analysis and part of the normal work of staff when this policy comes up. So when the courts r rule on this, I would expect that that to be completed as part of staff's analysis on this policy. Okay, thank you. Are there so any will... other? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Hager. Um, mine is really a follow up on the on Ms. Causey's last question. Is I guess why can't we? make any movement on the policy because I know there's litigation in, in process, but um, I guess is there some precedent for not moving forward or are we not allowed to move forward or is it just our choice because we don't want to duplicate staff time? It's not wise to move forward. It's very possible that the court will indicate that the, the board uh, should include um, the stakeholders or should change. We just don't know uh, if the board goes through the process of changing the policy and the court indicates that the policy is illegal, then you'll have to go through another analytical process and another review process. 
OK, that's all. Thank you. I think also there's also the possibility that we want to avoid making changes to the policy that could make a policy that's OK illegal. Like if the court's weighing on something, I think it's important to hear what they have to say before we go in making changes. But we will certainly uh, include the considerations mentioned by Ms. Causey, what other LEAs do, whether or not other LEAs have or local boards have stakeholders with a different sort of status. We will include that in any analysis and any research. Sure, I think the information I'm most interested in is what other than what is the criteria that decides who is and is not a stakeholder? Sure. Ms. Kazi, you had a follow up question and then. Um, yeah, I think it's just Ms. Kazi next. Go ahead. Thank you. So I um, wanted to understand. What is a estimate time frame for? Uh, the continued. Court. Situation. Sure not i do not know uh, the uh the court is not bound by a particular period of time uh the courts right now the trial courts right now are extremely backed up because of the number of trials that were postponed uh during the pandemic uh, so i don't know if that's one reason uh, for the length of time, but if I could predict, I would. I cannot predict. OK, I think I, I was just curious because I um, twice uh, there's been a petition to the state board and twice they've said it's not their jurisdiction. Uh, so if we waited all this time and then the circuit courts, uh, I believe that's where it is, uh, said it's not their jurisdiction. Um, you know, we don't want to wait too long. And what what we've seen is there is clearly a lack of um, criteria, clear criteria and a clear process, um, you know, because there were was uh, other groups that were added. So. I don't believe other groups have been added as stakeholders. Um, my recollection is that the the stakeholders that existed as of that particular school year, the stakeholders that you recognize and that none other have been added since that time. So as to the question about a process and what process the committee wants, that is certainly something that can be incorporated into the recommendations from staff as we go forward. And whenever we bring a recommended policy to you barring any further appeal by the the coalition. OK, so staff could consider um, the process by which the board appoints central, um, excuse me, area education advisory council members or uh, so special education citizens advisory group. So That's a different policy. Yeah, that that would be different from what which groups are considered to be by you, by the board or should be considered. Is it the number of people who are in the group? Is it uh, whether or not students are represented? Is it that they represent all areas of the county? Uh, those are all considerations that you all can discuss as to whether or not that's what you would like in a policy. OK, thank you. Well, OK. Um, moving on to item 2B, Appeals and Hearing Handbooks 2022-23. Ms. Howie. Thank you. Members of the committee, you were sent um, in June, actually, uh, this document. And just by way of introduction and background, uh, several years ago, this document um, was the brainchild of the policy review committee. It was the request of the committee that uh, staff uh, create a document that could be distributed to appellants uh, who were going forward under either policy 8340 or 8341. And this is this 
this document basically incorporates and explains the process of appeals. Uh, as you're well aware, most of the appeals to the board are from unrepresented persons, so individuals who do not have familiarity with legal processes. And the desire of PRC was that staff create a document that would explain to particularly unrepresented persons exactly how those two policies work. You know, what's going to happen if schools are closed? What's going to happen if offices are closed? Who's going to hear my case? What happens before the board? So those questions and answers are what this document attempts to address. As well, what we do each year is send this document to your panel of hearing examiners because they're the, the first line of defense, if you will. They're the ones who are actually carrying out the work and they send back recommended changes or um, amendments based on their experience during that school year. So some of the changes that you see are based on recommendations from your hearing examiner panel. Some of the recommendations are because of issues that have come up during the year. Uh, some are word changes. We've received from Ms. Hen this afternoon some word changes, um, some grammatical um, changes, so those will be incorporated. There are a few changes, however, and I did inform Ms. Hen that I don't believe we can incorporate. However, the great number, the, the large number of uh, changes she's recommended, the staff has no problems with. Happy to answer questions. Committee members, are there any questions? Ms. Cosby? Thank you. Is it clear in these guidelines, um, the communication path for how um, appellants, whether they're um, staff, employees, teachers, uh, administrators, or parents, um, as to the timing of um, the appeal requests or the timing of decisions. So before an appeal process is started, an appellant has to make a timely appeal. Mm -hmm. And um, there has been situations where um, the timing of the decision being made and starts a clock and a stakeholder who then wanted to become an appellant was not able to uh, because of the communication path, whether it was uh, mail that was not received, uh, even though email had been used in some of the correspondence. So, because I think it should be clear, and especially, um, again, with uh, a lot of impacts of COVID and um, on, on systems countywide, statewide, and nationwide, including um, mail service, uh, that digital transmission should be allowed through, especially if it's been used in the matter of the discussion of the issue. So is it made clear um, with that email is also included or in it terms is of- not. What is made clear is uh, what is in 6202, which is 10 days to appeal to the local board in 4205, which is 30 days from the date of the superintendent's decision to appeal, to note an appeal to the local board. Those time periods, as well as 7305, which is 15 days, all of those time periods are included in uh, not only in those policies, but as well in this document so that all the time periods are set forth in one place. So if I understand, the time periods are set, By law. but the but the method of communication of the decisions that start the time frame are not clarified. I'm not sure I understand your question, ma'am. So I believe she's asking what constitutes a timely file 
physical mail or does email included too and does the doc email yes, is not Ms. included Rapp. and thank you for the clarification email is not included in time what is timely filed uh, it is not that is correct okay and is email used in providing the potential appellant, whether it's an employee or a parent regarding a student matter, um, mm -hmm. is email used to notify those stakeholders and potential appellants of the decision? So I, I'm not going to use the, the term stakeholder. In this context, it would be appellant because if, for example, an individual is noting an objection to, for example, residency um, or uh, magnet, it's clear that they're already appealing. Uh, and when they're at, let's say, the superintendent's level, I can speak to that. I cannot speak to what happens prior to the superintendent's level. So either at the, um, that the level prior to uh, when it is directly appealed to the superintendent or to the superintendent's designee. Uh, my understanding is that those documents are mailed and they are mailed with confirmation delivery so that there is again confirmation of delivery. Okay, and so what what language um, would need to be included for the PRC and the, then the board to consider to also include via email? The board would have to change its policy. The policy indicates that appeals must be deposited in U.S. mail uh, or received in the board office physically. So you'd have to change your policy. OK, so that's the appellant uh, timely filing, but what is mm -hmm. required for uh, what language would be required and and where for PRC members and then the board so to consider so that whether it's staff or parents or guardians would receive the decision via email as well as via it would it would ha in my opinion you should change the policy because if okay, there so is again if there is an expectation that electronic mail communication be used in the appellate process i think in order to make sure that appellants and uh, staff are aware of the expectation of the board, then it should be in policy. So committee okay, members, you. just to clarify, this is the handbook that we're looking at and the handbook aligns with policy. So if there's things in the handbook that you wanna change that are specified in policy, that's not really what we're doing today. What we're looking at is to make sure that the policy that the handbook aligns with the policy we have. Yes, thank you. And some issues, you know, bring into question working backwards from the handbook to the policy, what is um, fair and um, consistent and effective. So, Ms. Howie, that would then be policy um, 4205. 8330, 8340, excuse me, and 8341. And would it also have to go back to policy? Um, I think, did you say? So the section 202 is the state, the Anatolian Code of Maryland. Yes, ma'am. 4205, okay. 6202, 7305 are sections of the education article and they set statutorily uh, the deadlines that exist for appeals to each local board and as well to the State Board of Education. Okay, thank you. And then would also policy 5560 
need to be amended so that uh, parents or guardians would receive decisions of the superintendent regarding student suspensions via I email? Think you, I think you would need 5550 as well, but yes, the discipline policies again would have to be uh, amended. What I would caution the committee to consider is whether or not the communities that you wish to serve have access to electronic mail. Uh, so the assumption that that is more efficient or that it's easier is not necessarily accurate. Well, thank you, Ms. Howie. I appreciate that because my, uh, what I, the way I would address it is to make it both, to be mailed signature receipt, but also via email. Are there any other committee members who have Thank you. Um, questions regarding the handbooks? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Ann, go ahead. Um, it's a, thank you. Um, is a motion required to adopt the copy edits that I provided to the committee and to Ms. Howie, those that are acceptable to staff? I don't believe so, ma'am, because the document is actually staff's document. Um, it's provided to PRC again because of the history to something PRC wanted. Um, and I can certainly summarize for you um, all of the, the changes that are accepted. There are just a very few that would have changed the meaning um, of what you wanted. That's not necessary. Thank, thank you, Ms. Howie. Truly. Okay. So, Ms. Howie, do we need a motion to um, accept the handbook or is this an informational piece? Information, ma'am. Okay. So, we will then move on to item 2C, policy 8500, board self evaluation. Ms. Howie, please continue. Thank you. Members of the committee, as you're aware, um, the policy on your self evaluation was addressed in the public works report, specifically a finding on page 72, recommendation 1-12, that the board should update its self-assessment instrument to include metrics and to conduct an assessment yearly. Uh, staff is bringing, has brought before you recommended changes to your self-assessment policy, your self-evaluation policy that includes um, an evaluation component and a process. This uh, policy was discussed previously at PRC. There was a recommendation at your March 30th, 2020 meeting uh, by Dr. Hager and Mr. Thomas uh, to add board committees to subsection 2B. That has been done. Uh, board committees is now found at line 38. Um, if there were, and I'm sorry, there was one other change that was requested, and that concerned uh, asking the Maryland Association of Boards of Education to facilitate the development of a self assessment tool. That language has been added to page two line 13 through 15. Committee members, are there any questions? Hearing none, can I have a motion to move policy 8500 to the full board for approval with the recommendation from the committee to approve? Ms. Kazi, you have a question? Go ahead. Ms. Kazi. Yes, thank you. Uh, so part of the discussion at a prior uh, PRC meeting related to the student member of the board and um, the fact that the student members of the board start on July 1 and mm -hmm. then Go serve through the school year and then their term ends on June 30th. Um, and I don't uh, see anything in here that addresses the timing of the self-evaluation so that um, the 
the student member of the board could submit the evaluation and then um, prior to the end of their term. Did I? So and I, uh, I do apologize on that or I thought we had moved. Uh, so um, it was May when the board adopted its self assessment. Thought we had moved it from um, June, July and August to May, June and July, but I can certainly look at the earlier draft. Um, so is does is the committee's pleasure that this these be different months? April, May and June makes more sense for the student member to participate. Because they end in June in the end of June. And in fact, sometimes the student member. Depending on when the school year ends. Would have to be like that first meeting in June because once they're finished with the school year, they may not come back. So is it the committee's pleasure that a one now read um, April annually in April? The board will conduct its self assessment and then annually in May the board will conduct an assessment based upon the metrics and then annually in June or no later than June of each school year. The board will create and publish for the public a plan to address deficiencies. Are there any objections to that from any committee members? Um, let let's let let um Miss Hassan comment first since she is a student member. Thank you. Um, so I first of all I I think I do think it should be changed to annually in April and then no later than I believe you said May or sorry June. Um, not only for the sake of the student member but also for our sake as a collective. Um, I can guarantee, I know I can speak for myself, I can't speak for every student member, but I can speak to myself and um, to the knowledge that I have of previous student members and what I hope for the future is that the student member will be returning after the school year ends. We are not here just for the duration of the school year. Um, so even if it were to stay as you know annually in May, um, the board will update its self-assessment instrument to include metrics as determined by the board. I don't see a major problem with that, especially because the student member will still continue to be there and they will still be able to submit their self assessment. Um, also, additionally, no student member, to my knowledge, has ever missed the June meeting, so I don't see how that would be such a significant issue. While I do agree that the student member should be able to participate, I don't think that as this policy stands currently, I don't believe it already poses a huge issue. So that's my perspective as the student member um, and as you know, also a board member in participating in this self-assessment. Um, however, I do believe that if we are moving it back a month, I don't think it should be only for the student member's sake. I think it should be for our sake so we're able to move forward faster so that the board has the ability to view that self-assessment as a whole more effectively. OK, so. Um, I think one of the benefits of moving it to April, May and June is also so that it's not just a case of filling out the self assessment and turning it in. It's also a case of the discussions that the board has surrounding those self assessments. So if we're publishing something um, in June. Then having all of those discussions in May means that everyone is there to participate. We usually have two meetings in May. And I like the idea of having it say April, May, and June for multiple reasons, particularly so the student member can fully participate, but um, also for other reasons as well. So are there any objections from the committee members to changing those months? from May, June and July to April, May and June. No objections okay. for me. Can you, OK, can you hearing that. I have, a um, I have a question. Can you clarify the expectations for the board's activity in June? My only concern is that we have all of our graduations in June and I want so to make the, sure that what we're do, we can deliver on that. 
commitment. So what happens in June would be number three. It says no, it would read no later than June of each school year. The board will create and publish for the public a plan to address deficiencies identified in its self-evaluation. So conceivably you'd be doing that in May. Right, and then it gets published in July. Or in June, sorry. In June. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, hearing I'm no objections. All right. Yeah. Hearing no objections, those changes stand. And Ms. Holly can edit that. Um, Ms. Causey, you had a comment? Yes, thank you. Um, I, um, in, on page one, line 27, no later than, which will now be June, no later than June of each school year, the board will create and publish for the public a plan to address deficiencies identified in its self evaluation. Um, I think it would be, um, it would better serve the board and the public um, to address areas for improvement identified in its self evaluation, because it may not be that it's deficient and then we would have to define some standard for deficiency. Um, but areas of improvement. There's been um, different cycles of the board where um, engagement in advisory council meetings has been outstanding and there's been different periods and I'm talking over eight years um, that it's been uh, not amazing. So I think that the board, when it's evaluating um, the self-assessment that's compiled after all the members have completed it, uh, that they could plan to publicize those areas that they're going to focus on for improvement. Um, because then they don't need to get into what's a deficiency and they don't need to just uh, make it known what the uh, goals and efforts are going to be for the next year. So um, is there any objection to changing the word deficiencies? to areas of improvement. Hearing none, that wording change stands. Um, Ms. Howie, you can um, edit that. And is that the Please. only place, Ms. Howie, in the document where deficiencies is used in that context? Or are there I other so. places? Yes, ma'am, that's the only place. OK. Um, and I think that's a good change to make, considering that we try to positively word everything for teachers, students, et cetera. It's consistent with how we do things. Are there any other changes to the document that anyone would like to present? So I have one more question. Yes, this Ms. Causey. Um, so on page two, line 17, it states, uh, implementation, the board shall implement this policy. Um, previously, there have not been um, rules associated with um, some of the board policies. And so I wondered, is this something then that needs to be included in a handbook revision? Um, or is um, where else would, you know, the actual process be outlined? So I know that we've talked before members of the committee, Ms. Causey, about where it's appropriate to have a superintendent's rule and in 99% of the 8000 series, it's not uh, appropriate because the board is implementing. So if the board's desire is that you have another document that further um, explains the procedures, that gets to be more granular. You certainly could include it in your handbook, uh, or you certainly could have an appendix to this document that explains, um, as I said, in a more granular fashion, uh, the procedures that you will use to ensure that you implement your policy. Thank you for that response. So in legal reference, would it be appropriate to add the board handbook, um, 
happy to add that as um, as a related policy or related document. Okay, um, Ms. Rowe, would is you like to see objection? if there's consensus? Yeah. Is there any objection to adding the board handbook to um, the legal reference or related policies section? Ms. Howie, I'll let you decide exactly how that should be worded there. Sure. Are there any objections? Hearing none, that um, amendment stands. Thank Are you. there any objections to moving this policy forward with the recommendation of the committee as amended? Okay, hearing none, this policy is moved forward with the recommendation of the committee to the full board. Our next item is item 2D, policy 8501, superintendent's evaluation. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Dr. Williams is also present for this item. Uh, in case you had questions about this particular policy, once again, uh, referring to the public works report, this recommendation 1-11, that the board should refine the superintendent's evaluation instrument to include key metrics. Uh, and then require the board legal counsel to compile the results and implement quarterly updates on progress. Uh, there is a new section that's been added to 8501. That's section two evaluative process that outlines the process that the board would use in evaluating the superintendent, which includes uh, an update to the superintendent and discussion of progress during the evaluative period. I'm av available to answer questions, as is Dr. Williams, should he so desire. Committee members, are there any questions? Dr. Uh, Hager? Yeah, I just, um, since Dr. Williams is here, I just wanted to see if he had any um, any thoughts or revisions or, or anything on, on this policy? I mean, to me, it reads as we have been doing it over the past two years, but um, I'd love to hear his thoughts since he took the time to be with us today. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, when I first came to this to the system, we met with the board and outlined the tool and reached agreement regarding data points. And I think the policy as written, the board has followed unless there was some amendments with the time frame, and it was agreed upon by both parties, myself and the board, to extend based on circumstances. A lot of it was dealing with the pandemic. So I think we have worked collaboratively to complete this. Um, and so I don't have anything to offer to change um, based on the, the written policy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Committee members, are there any other questions? Hearing none, is there any objection to moving policy 8501, superintendent's evaluation to the full board with recommendation? Ms. Rao. Yes. I had um, typed in the chat that I had a question. This is Ms. Causey. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for being here for this important discussion. Um, on page one of uh, the draft policy 8501 on line 16, it states annually prior to the beginning of the school year, the superintendent and the board chair shall meet to agree on a format evaluation instrument and annual goals and objectives for the superintendent's annual evaluation. The board shall approve the evaluation instrument. Um, and as um, Dr. Williams pointed out the superintendent's evaluation was um, outlined in his employment contract. So I think there needs to be some change to the language and I'm open to hearing from staff what that would be to reflect um, number one, that there may already be um, elements in the employment contract with the superintendent that need to be adhered to. And also, it's um, not been the case that the board chair would 
be the only one engaged in the agreement process of uh, the format um, evaluation instrument and the annual goals and objectives that are contained in that uh, annual evaluation. So I don't think that that, I think that paragraph needs work. Ms. Calvi, which paragraph are you referring to? To a page one, line 16. Paragraph 2A. That's true. We actually have a committee, a, um, an ad hoc committee for the evaluation instrument. It's not actually the board chair at all. The ad hoc committee does that. So it sounds like two different processes. The ad hoc committee comes up, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, the ad hoc committee presents uh, a document. This doesn't necessarily um, excise the committee from the process, simply indicates that the board chair is the one who initiates the process. Okay. Is there something okay. else that so the, the committee wanted included? So the way it reads, the board chair shall meet to agree on a format slash evaluation instrument mm -hmm. and annual goals and objections for the superintendent. The board chair doesn't actually do any of that. The ad hoc committee does all of that um, in closed session with the full board. Um, so the ad hoc committee presents to the full board and then that happens. So more accurately, it would reflect that. Um, yeah, the only thing the board chair does is just put it on the closed session agenda. And then the ad hoc committee does everything else. So I'm not sure how we word that to be more accurate, but the wording does need to change. So Miss Rowe, um, the ad hoc committee was created after the contract was established and so I guess the question is for the full board do we, do they see the ad hoc committee still existing because at the end of the day what ends up happening the tool itself did not change the the board decided not to change the tool and the goals were not changed because there were some specific data that the board wanted to monitor. To your point, it still came back to the full board for agreement. So whether it's the chair or the ad hoc, the ad hoc committee was something that was created based on the need at that time. So I think the question is, the policy could be amended to include the ad hoc, but if that's the agreement of the full board, to continue to have an ad hoc committee versus the board leadership, or I'm sorry, the board chair. But I just want to give some reference, some context that it was during my first year that it was felt we, there needed to be have a board, an ad hoc committee to finalize the tool and the data points. But all of that came back to the full board for agreement. Sure, I think my concern with the way this is written right now is that there's nothing in A that actually suggests that the chair would have to bring anything back to the full board for agreement or even have an ad hoc committee since ad hoc committees serve at the pleasure of the board. I would rather see this policy have a standing committee um, for the superintendent's evaluation that involves the full board as a matter of policy as to having only the chair involved because the, the wording of this is somewhat problematic because theoretically you could have a chair that maybe just doesn't like the superintendent, decides to change everything on their own and send an instrument that people don't really like to the full board that ends up not being fair to the superintendent. So, so I think this... having a committee is better so Ms. Rowe, if you notice the last sentence of A is the board shall approve the evaluation instrument. So the chair may be having the discussion, but the board is final 
uh, has a final approval. Um, one possibility would be to take out the word chair from line 17. So the superintendent and the board shall meet to agree on a format or evaluation instrument. Uh, if this committee establishes a standing committee, please be aware that if you are forming by policy another committee, that committee would be subject to the Open Meetings Act. Okay. I like the idea of removing the word chair. Ad hoc. So, Ms. Rowe, the, yes. the ability of the ad hoc to be formed um, is the right of the chair to do. So the chair okay. can delegate that authority to the ad hoc. So it's more of an, I would say, administrative role to bring back the recommendation and the evaluation to the full board for the full board to agree upon. So, so that's something that, that the chair can do to delegate that, that responsibility that is assigned in policy to an ad hoc, create the ad hoc, have the ad hoc do that work, and then bring that recommendation back to the full board without having to establish a standing, you know, a permanent standing committee and I then see. bring that back to the full board. So it's still approved by the full board. It's just a working group to, for that one task. Okay. How does everyone feel about removing the word chair? Well, I, I think it's worked well. So the only um, role currently that has that for policy is the chair to conform the the ad hoc committee. But so in A, if we remove the word chair, then it says the superintendent and the board shall meet to agree on a formative of it. Um, is there any and, downside and, that anyone sees to removing the word chair? Because having the full board meet to develop that and and do that work is less than practical, ma'am. That's the only downside I see. Is there any other comments on this? Dr. Hager? I was typing that I was confused at where we're leaving off. So well, are we... I don't I don't know that we have a real consensus to do anything with the wording as it is. Unless but other people in the committee like have it's... ideas. My interpretation of what Ms. Hen was saying was that if um, if it stays as the board chair, then the board chair can appoint an ad hoc committee and that wouldn't be against the current policy. Is that correct? That's her position, yes. If that's the case, then I, I'm fine with it saying board chair personally, but I defer to others. If the committee thinks it's fine the way it is, I'm content to proceed. Just to make a, a comment, it goes back to the full board as Ms. Howie's. Whatever the ad hoc committee recommends, every time it will go back to the full board. So I okay. think it covered in that line 20 or 21 that says the board still has to approve the tool. Okay, Ms. Kazi. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this discussion. Um, I think the paragraph needs reworking um, because I don't believe that it should be annually um, that the superintendent and whether it's the board or the board chair agree on a format evaluation instrument and annual goals and objectives for the superintendent's annual evaluate evaluation because what we have uh, learned through the public works recommendations is that communicating the goals and objectives um, should be very strategic and it should not just be, you know, one year at a time that a superintendent and the board um, are, are figuring out what's important for this year. So um, when Dr. Williams was hired, um, he was hired and the board said we need a new um, strategic plan. And so upon approval of that strategic plan, um, 
then those goals were were identified uh, and public works clarified that we needed to have the actual metrics, both the baseline from which uh, we want to see improvement and then what is the metric for the for the improvement. So, I mean, maybe if the language is if they need to modify um, the format um, or the goals and objectives, because we also know uh, that uh, the metrics can change and the um, expectations of what can be done um, given drastic circumstances may need to be modified. Um, but I don't think that every year the entire um, evaluation instrument and goals and objectives should be um, able to be completely modified. I'll let so, Dr. Williams speak to yeah. that. So Ms. Causey, thank you for raising that. Um, it's similar to how we deal with our school progress plans. We develop school progress plans and we review them quarterly, but we also have an annual review of our school progress plans. And in that annual review, it doesn't mean that we may change a goal. The outcome may not be where we want to be at that particular time, but still that goal, that objective, will still be pertinent for the upcoming year. So as I'm looking at the policy, you know, it shall meet to agree, doesn't mean that every time we meet annually that the tool would change, but there's some circumstances that may cause the data to change in terms of availability. So just because it says annually, there is this session to take place, it doesn't necessarily mean that the tool and the goals would change annually. That's how I'm interpreting that, and that's how we deal with school improvement process, that we look at it uh, on a regular basis, and we look to see what we have access to, which may lead to some tweaking of the objective or data points, but doesn't necessarily mean that every year the tool will change. I don't know, Ms. Howie, are, are, you, are you seeing it the same way yes, as written? Sir. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. I appreciate that. Um, I would then um, suggest that the paragraph A as um, was suggested that the chair be removed and it's the board um, and the chair in policy uh, has a responsibility to facilitate the work of the board. So if the board chair uh, determined that an ad hoc committee in one year would be the way to facilitate the work of the board um, to be efficient or effective, then the board chair would have that um, ability. Um, and if the board as a whole decided that um, another path should be taken, uh, then the board as a whole can do that either through agenda setting um, or you know, any other votes that could be taken. Ms. Cosby, I don't believe we have clear consensus on that. So would you actually um, make a motion for that change? Certainly. I move that to amend draft policy 8501, line, page one, line 17, to remove the word chair. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Is there any discussion? Okay, please call the roll. Ms. Quasi? I'm assuming you're in favor. Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Hassan? Ms. Rowe? No. I have one in favor and three against. Okay, the motion fails. Um, Ms. Kazi, did you have another edit to the document? Yes, thank you. Um, Public Works recommendations uh, were clear that the Board Council would receive and compile the evaluations um, and the superintendent's evaluations. 
and facilitate that um, process. And I don't see that included in this policy draft. If staff could speak recommend to that. A, a location for that because that is something I've always found um, a little bit odd is that we ask, you know, the superintendent is the secretary treasurer of the board and the executive assistant of the board essentially works for the superintendent. And yet we ask her to handle all of the superintendent evaluation. And um, it does make more sense to me that the board of Park works recommendation that board council do this just does make more sense to me. Um, can you recommend, though, where in this document that language might best appear? So I'm not sure that it makes sense to put it in a policy. And uh, as members of this committee are well aware, uh, once something is enshrined in policy, it's extremely difficult to be able to change it. Uh, certainly the board chair and the board can direct the uh, the board council to take whatever action you want board council to take. Assuming that that is the procedure you wish to use uh, as opposed to using your executive your senior executive assistant, uh, I think that's that's an operational question. If that is what the board wishes to enshrine in policy, that certainly the board's um, it's at the board's pleasure, but it seemed more administrative and something that the board would wish to discuss prior to putting it in a policy. Dr. Hager, you had a question? Um, yes, I, I definitely see what Ms. Howie is saying, but I, I do think that it is important to have an external party be the one who um, compiles the evaluation in order to kind of take away any any social desirability bias or anything that might happen in the future. I, I think that it does. Um, I think there's some utility in, in ensuring that that happens. It, it shouldn't take very much time, I would imagine. I, do, I know we do pay our board council, um, you know, by, by the time that they're putting in, but I, I would imagine it, it it's a worthwhile venture. And I don't know, I, I, do, I do like the idea of putting it in policy personally. OK, so Ms. Howie, mm -hmm. if the committee would desire to put it in this policy, do you have a recommendation as to where? I would add. Uh, I would add it to subsection B. Subsection B, OK. And Ms. Causey, you put a, uh, an amendment in chat. Could you please um, make that motion out loud, please? Thank you. Um, I move to amend policy 8501 to include a paragraph with language that the board council will facilitate the superintendent's evaluation process, including but not limited to receive and compile individual board member evaluations. Is there a second? Second. That was Ms. Hen. Is there any discussion? Dr. Hager? Um, I don't love the word facilitate just because I, again, I think that the role should simply be to um, receive and compile. I, I think I, wor I worry that the word facilitate would take away the, the role of the ad hoc committee that has happened thus far or whatever happens in the future. Um, that's my only concern about the amendment, but otherwise I, I think receive and compile is, is, a, is a good addition. So, Ms. Rowe, uh, if I may respond. Yes. Thank Go you. Ahead. I appreciate Dr. Hager's uh, question and comment. Um, in the past years, um, the board council not as a uh, has been it utilized um, in facilitating the superintendent's evaluation process, including um, the ad hoc if they had questions about what was uh, in alignment with the contract, the superintendent's contract, which is a legal document. Um, so this is just um, clarifying and putting in policy um, what has happened and what it would be helpful to be clear uh, to happen in the future, especially given the transition um, in the upcoming um, board election and appointment cycle. 
um, I think clarity is is really vital. And I I'm not familiar with the with how uh, board council was used previously, uh, but my concern with using that word, first of all, I don't believe that was what was anticipated by Public Works. And if it is your desire to um, summarize what Public Works wanted, I don't believe that is what Public Works requested or suggested. And that council is carrying out an administrative function. Um, and not to say this in a negative uh, way or in a demeaning way in any way, but a secretarial function in compiling and giving those results back to uh, the board in summary fashion. Uh, a facilitation sounds more like a directive uh, function as opposed to an administrative or a ministerial function. And I'm not sure that's how you use council. Okay, so would anyone object um, to the idea that we strike the language will facilitate the superintendent's evaluation process including but not limited to so that that way it would read include a paragraph with language that the board council will receive and compile individual board member evaluation so miss Rowe, if i may yes um if there's a if there's a concern with the word facilitate, um, maybe to, and I'm not sure that that concern is amongst all the members here, but um, I have that. It concern. could be, it could be uh, the board council will assist the board in the superintendent's evaluation process, including but not limited to receive and compile the individual board member evaluations. Um, Mr. Roman, I make a suggestion. Hang on, uh, Ms. Hassan had a question. Go ahead, Ms. Hassan. Sorry, thank you. Um, so actually, I was going to suggest almost exactly what Ms. Causey said, because from my understanding in the past, um, the ad hoc committee has been the one to facilitate the process. And, and you know, council has always been sort of a supporting feature. I believe this past year was the first time council um, facilitated the process. So my my thought and I guess my question is, can we like can we all agree, I guess, that if this motion is to continue um, and, and amend that language, can we use the term aid in or support or something more assisting so that the ad hoc committee takes um, like more of a leading role in this process rather than legal counsel, just to ensure that we have that consistency. I think replacing the word facilitate with support is good. And um, Roja, just to clarify, what this section is really, this amendment is really getting to, is that typically it's the board administrative um, executive assistant who collects and compiles all of the board member evaluations. Um, and the concern of some board members in the past has been that oddly information that certain board members put on their evaluation forms ends up in the possession of other board members. And so having the attorney do it creates a level of confidentiality for each individual board member, but also protects the executive assistant from accusations. Is there any objection to replacing the word facilitate with support? Ms. Ms. Rowe, I had a suggestion. Ms. Ms. Hen? Yes, Sorry, I was to going you, to suggest. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. I'd like to use this um, phrase, suggest we use the phrase shall serve as a resource to the board. So it would be the board council shall serve as a resource for the superintendent's evaluation process. Is that what your intention is? Yes. 
um, Dr. Dr. Wood, you had a comment? Yes, uh, thank you. I went back to the public works document and I'm going to read verbatim what's in that document. It says the board chair should cause the implementation process to occur quarterly with results compiled by the legal counsel for progress updates. So I think there's a way to take that motion and say it's the board's responsibility to implement the process and the legal counsel will compile the results. Now, I, I do recognize that Ms. Howie referenced that feels a little bit more administratively, and um, I, I'm not aware of any complication with the current process that we're using. However, if you want to follow what's in the public works, it references really the board, this is the board's responsibility and the results are compiled by the legal counsel. So that so may that, help with the language than okay. facilitating. So that aligns with what Ms. Hen's um, suggestion was to change the language so that the board counsel will, how, could you type that into chat how you change that Ms. Hen? Now I've forgotten precisely what it was. To use the word support instead of shall so, serve shall serve as a resource to the board. I I'm not somewhere I can type. I'm, okay. I'm joining by phone. So if somebody could type in the chat okay. for me, I'd I appreciate just typed it. it in. Um, serve as a resource to the board. Okay, so that would change. Um why is my school not working? OK, so that would change um, the language. That board council shall serve as a resource. To the board for the superintendent's evaluation process, including but not limited to receive and compile individual board member evaluations. Does anyone object to that language? Ms. Rowe. Yeah. This is Ms. Causey. Um, on page, I just wanted to clarify um, public works language on page 13 of the 749 page report that says um, update itself assessment, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry, refine the superintendent's evaluation instrument to include some key metrics, require the board legal counsel to compile the results and implement quarterly board updates on progress. Right, OK, that's Thank you. exactly what I said in. All right, so I'm going to read this again. And. If anyone objects to this language, then we'll. Vote on the language. Um, so. Does anyone object to the language? Board Council shall serve as a recess to the resource to the board for the superintendent's evaluation process, including but not limited to receive and compile individual board member evaluations. So Ms. Rowe, th this is Erin Hager. Um, OK, I, I don't. I don't object necessarily. I just it seems a little unnecessary because the board council is always a resource to the board, um, but I think for, for time's sake, I, I, I do not object to it. It's fine. OK, so hearing no objections, that language stands. Um, Ms. Howie, you can edit that. Uh, are there any objections to moving policy 8501 superintendent's evaluation as amended to the full board for approval? Hearing none, the policy moves to the full board. Um, item 2E, Ethics Code Policies, New Comar Provisions. Uh, Ms. Holly, our meeting was supposed to end at 6. Yes. Is that correct? And how long do you anticipate this agenda item to take? In order to do it justice, at least a half hour. OK, are the committee members able to stay until 6.30 at the latest? 
Is anyone unable to stay? You can type in the chat. Okay, Ms. Kazi can stay. Ms. Hassan can stay. I can stay. We'll I try for 6.15, but let's just say 6.30 at the latest. Okay, thank you okay. committee members for your forbearance. Um, Mr. Corns, if you could please display the first slide. So members of the committee, um, you have before you recommended changes to policies 8360, 8362, 8363, and 8364, which are part of the ethics code. And just in terms of process, the each local board of education must adopt an ethics code. And these codes must be approved by the State Ethics Commission or the SEC. In March of this year, the SEC notified every local board of education in the state that as the result of changes during the 2021 legislative session, that changes were required to the local board policy. Uh, as a result, uh, staff approached the, um, the chair of PRC and asked that these policies be added to last year's schedule. Uh, unfortunately, we were unable to get to these policies last year. So what I've done in the policy analysis is summarize for you the changes that we are recommending as a result of changes to the statute, changes that the statute has made. Um, and there were two bills actually that were passed during the 2021 session. One um, HB 363 that was chapter 253 of the um, uh, of the 2021 laws officials and employees acceptance of public acceptance of gifts and prohibited retaliation then house bill 1058 integrity and high office act that is at chapter 425 and mr corns if you could display the first slide please so in your thank you, Mr. Corns. In your um, in your share drive, I provided this table to you. I thought it would be easier to um, digest the the changes if you had this in table format. I just want to go through them uh, based on again the changes that we're recommending. In 8360, which is your definitions policy, we are recommending three changes. Compensation, which follows the model policy. Actually, it simply changes uh, the words into to individual from person. Contribution, this is not a result of change to the public ethics law. This is actually Ms. Clark being her exceptional self and recognizing that in 2022, there were changes to the elections law. So we are recommending changes to the um, definition of contribution. And quasi-governmental agency is the result of changes in the public ethics law that now must be defined. In policy 8362, which is your gifts policy, we are recommending based on the changes that were made in the 2021 uh, session that uh, the acceptance of gifts from associations engaged in representing counties or municipal corporations be included. Again, this is as a result of changes in the law. Next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Policy 8363, there are two changes we're recommending. One that would now make clear that a former official or uh, a former employee is prohibited from disclosing confidential information. That is now in the General Provisions Article 5507 as well that uh, the anti-retaliation language that is now in general provisions article 5509 
that that language as well be placed in 8363. And for the final set of changes, the next slide, please, Mr. Corns. These changes are recommended for 8364, which is your financial disclosure policy. The first several changes have to do with expanding what has to be reported and what has to be disclosed. The final change on this page is a result of the public works recommendation that the posi position of deputy superintendent be added to the organization. Deputy superintendent was not a position that was required to file a financial disclosure statement. As a result, staff is recommending that that job title be listed in policy 8364 so that that individual be required to file a financial disclosure statement and that it be clear that that is what is required. As I indicated, this, um, this chart has been dropped in your share point drive so that you're able to access the information just a little bit differently. Um, again, uh, it seems as if just about every LEA uh, missed this. This was these were changes in the 2021 session. And as you see from the policy analysis, there are only eight um, sister school systems that have adopted uh, changes based on what happened in 2021. And all of that has been in the last couple of months since we've heard from the State Ethics Commission. In an abundance of caution, I did reach out to the State Ethics Commission, to the Council, to make sure that the changes that were being brought forward to you were on track with what the SEC expected uh, when it sent out these changes to all of the local boards of education and was given the green light with respect to these changes. I did not want to bring the changes forward have the board approve and then have the SEC give us a thumbs down. We do have a thumbs up with these changes. And with that, I'm available to answer questions. OK, committee members, I would just like to remind you that Thank the, you, committee, Mr. That the committee did decide to review these policies with just these legal changes. So the policies will still continue in the rotation for review in the schedule. But today we're just looking at these changes, not every aspect of every policy. Um, so are there any questions related to these changes? Hearing none, does anyone object to moving these policies forward to the full board for approval? Ms. Causey, you have a question? Yes, thank you. So. Um, was there, were there model policies developed by um, the Maryland State Department around it, or the Maryland, excuse me, the Maryland State Department of Education, or uh, uh, additional changes to the State Ethics Commission? So it would be I the see, other way around. It would be the SEC that would recommend, and they do have a model policy. Uh, and yes, we did follow their model policy in making these changes. Okay, thank you. So, in um, so is the State Ethics Commission's model Board of Education ethics regulation? That's where the model listed? policy is. Yes, thank you. Is it listed as a legal reference? in each of these policies? I believe it is, yes ma'am. Okay, thank you. And then when it, the issue of um, protection from retaliation for um, filing an ethics complaint or being involved in an investigation, mm -hmm. does that apply to board members not being retaliated against? And is that clear in the draft policy? 
I believe that what the well, and to answer your second question first about including, um, so I would refer you to, um, uh, for example, page six of policy draft 8360 legal references does, does include model board of education ethics regulations 1905-0300. And with respect to retaliation, I believe the model policy as well as our policy reads any person. Um, so it would not, it would by definition include board members in the anti-retaliation. Okay, thank you. Sorry. And it would also include then employees, for instance. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hager. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, so just to clarify um, the addition of the University of Maryland medical system language, um, it doesn't mean that a board member can't be an employee of the University of Maryland medical system. I was not, but just just throwing it out there is just specifying that that is part of the kind of the larger government network. So I was part of a, a university, state university, and I had to get ethics approval to sit on the school boards. So that's just saying, specifying that. Is that correct? That's correct. I just, it went through the process have, of Apple to do that. And, and yeah. You have to report it under the new statute. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Ms. Causey, the specific language in the model policy that is in the, uh, that is, that uh, addresses the anti-retaliation, an official or employee may not retaliate against an individual. So again, individual could be board member, could be employee, could be uh, a member of the public actually. So it doesn't specifically say that board members are protected from retaliation. It doesn't specifically exclude any person who reports an individual for reporting. So Ms. Howie, in this case, it could even be a student. Yes. Okay. I think that's pretty broad sweeping. Um, are there any more questions or comments to this? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Hen? Yes, thank you. Um, under the analysis item three, yes, the change prohibiting the disclosure of confidential information by former official or employee, mm -hmm. um, if I'm reading this correctly, that's updated in policy 8363. Is that correct? correct. Yes, ma'am, that's correct. I, I'm apologize. I was looking at 8362. Um, Never mind, and that is reflected. No, I'm not. Can you refer me to where that's that change is reflected in that policy? Sure. If you just give me a moment, there is a new paragraph that was added, and that is at. I'm not saying it. Oh, I do that. Retaliation. I'm sorry, were you, were you asking about retaliation? My brain just turned off. Um, or or the disclosure. Former, the former. Disclosure of confidential. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Page five, starting Perfect. at subsection or line one. And the new paragraph, I do apologize, is about retaliation. That's on page six. So page um, page five, subsection eight, disclosure of confidential information um, includes or former school official or former public, yes, or former public position okay. um, is included there, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Um, are there any other questions? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. So um, in determining if a board member or employee 
um, <clears throat> has a interest in a business or a family member that has um, a job with a business or an organization that has uh, business with the school system, there have been uh, two different ways that I'm aware of over the years where um, board members or employees can look at the companies that are doing business with the school board. Previously, it was spotlight on spend, mm -hmm. but that was not updated timely. And so in the um, in the analysis of when you are supposed to do your financial disclosure statement versus when the information is available, um, mm -hmm. there was a gap. And in the current um, format, that is a, and um, Dr. Williams or staff can clarify, um, currently it's a spreadsheet that is developed um, by school system staff uh, that includes a list of all vendors um, or organizations with whom the school system is doing business. And is there any designation in this policy of where board members, employees, or applicants uh, to the board would go to get that information? No, ma'am. There are um, directions, if you will, in the instructions to the completion of the financial disclosure statements where an individual could search, but as to whether or not the list itself is comprehensive, um, I believe at this point it is, um, after the cyber attack, I believe it has been rebuilt, uh, but as to whether or not that's in policy, no ma'am, it is not. Okay, I think it would be helpful to have in policy uh, where the responsibility lies and where um, these individuals, board members, employees, uh, applicants for board members can go to look at that information. That is up to the committee and ultimately up to the board uh, as to how you'd like to amend your policy. So what is the committee's pleasure? So Ms. Howie, which policy would that go in, do you think? So it um, could go into um, A364 with respect to financial disclosure statements. Uh, it could also, yeah, I think A364 is probably the best place for it. And Ms. Tazi, so, what are you suggesting that we have language that specify whose responsibility it is to keep the list of entities doing business with the school system current and the location of where that list is kept? Is that what you want in policy? Yes, I think, again, it, it's important um, that the public understand and also that the individuals that uh, need to comply with this uh, can understand where that information is. Ms. Howie, do you have a suggestion for language and the location for that language in this policy? So what I would caution the committee about, however, is that I if 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 what you're trying to do is to indicate that because information is deficient, there wasn't an obligation, I don't think this will meet that need or that I don't desire. Think, I don't think that's what we're trying to do. I okay. think what we're trying to do is specify in the policy that such and such a entity, the superintendent, whatever, I suppose for policy, the superintendent would be good, that the superintendent is responsible to ensure that the database of all entities doing business with the school system is kept current and that the location of that database will be published in XYZ location. So if we had language like that in the policy, then I think that would be what Ms. Causey is looking for. Is that correct, Ms. Causey? Yes, thank you. Because at the end of policy 8364, um, mm -hmm. it 
doesn't even have the normal statement of who is going to implement this policy. Sure, we need that's, that too. Well, that's this policy with respect to financial disclosure statements really is your ethics panels and your ethics panel has the ability by your policy and by state law to interpret your ethics code, which is why they issue advisory opinions. OK, so where in here could we state the superintendent's responsibility to keep that database updated? And. Um, I suppose publishing it on the website. Or a link to on the website would be appropriate. Thinking as I'm writing, which is somewhat dangerous members of the committee. I'm just trying to avoid sending this back to staff. So we'll wait for you. I do agree with Ms. Causey that this is important. So I'm thinking along these lines for the purposes of compliance with this policy. Reporting. To this policy. The school system will make publicly available the vendors and entities with whom the school system does business. Does that get close to what the committee was the committee's concern. So by saying it that way, does that imply that the superintendent is responsible for doing that? Because his employees are the only ones in possession of that information. So I don't see I was trying to make sure that it was actually more diffuse. Um, and school system is referenced as far as doing business uh, and indebtedness. So, and actually it's entities doing business with the school system. Uh, the entities. So for the purposes of compliance, with reporting under this policy, the school system will make publicly available the entities. No, that still doesn't sound right. I'm sorry. Yeah, the entities with whom the school system does business. OK, I'm satisfied with that. Does anyone object to that language? I see Ms. Kazi typing. Do you have something to say? Uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I think that that sounds um, good, but it does not seem to include um, a reference to a timely manner given legal filing requirements. And I'm not sure that current is is timely, isn't it? Can you read your language again, Ms. Howie? Sure. For the purposes of compliance with the reporting under this policy, the school system will make publicly available the entities with whom the school system does business. So if we're talking compliance, then in order to make sure that an individual knows what which entities the entities with which the school system does business, 
it would presuppose that it's current, but it does not say that. Can we put the current entities? So, I'm not sure that that addresses fully the issue because let's yeah. say that it's not a current entity, but it overlaps with the period for reporting. You, the individual yeah, would I, still I be required to provide the uh, the information that that's that's someone with whom there is employment or a business interest. So what we want is so what if we had language after that statement that said that the school system will supply this list for the reporting period um, by January 30th. That way it gives people time between then and April to explore that list for the reporting period. So are you anticipating that there's a separate list that's just Well, I'm anticipating reporting? that it's entirely possible that each list could be different for each reporting period. So if the school system has to, and on top of that, if people have to amend their thing, then they might want to go back and see the list for a specific reporting period. So really what we want is for the school system to create a list, release it on January 30th, because the reporting period ends December 31st, mm -hmm. and then that list is for that reporting period, and those lists for each reporting period can be posted on the website, and it gives the person enough time between January 30th and April to peruse that list and find um, who they may have business with that they need to report on their financial disclosure forms. But if you were to have some reason to amend a financial disclosure form, you might need to go back and see a list for a specific reporting period, which might be different than the list for the current reporting period. So it might just be that we need a PDF of a list for each reporting period. Ms. Rowe, if I may ask Ms. a question. Kology. Thank you. Um, I think setting a specific time frame is um, would not be appropriate for a number of reasons. One, um, the timely manner to file an ethics financial disclosure statement, um, although there is a set deadline for current individuals who are required to file ethics financial disclosure statements. There are also exceptions to that, which includes uh, off cycle appointments by the governor to fill vacancies uh, by the um, ending of a uh, em employee or a board member's um, tenure with the system. Um, and also, um, I guess my question is, what is the retention for these records given um, their, you know, their legal requirement? Um, Which records? And the whatever financial system is used by the school system to provide this information, because here you have ethics financial disclosure statement uh, filed um, which has legal responsibility with it and where is the proof if you will of an individual's filling out their form based on information provided to that individual so i would think that the the format for providing the vendors uh time frame of doing business would be a document that would have, I don't know, at least a five year or 10 year um, retention. Well, um, if, it's, if it's PDFs posted on the website, you could easily have those documents available for the duration mm -hmm. the FDS for those periods are kept, right? So. If you had a PDF on the website of a list of vendors, 
for a specific reporting period, or maybe you could update that list quarterly so that if somebody comes in midterm, they have at least a previous quarter to look at. Um, those PDFs could stick around on the website along the same cycle as the FDS. So at the point that a particular reporting period, the FDS is no longer have to be kept, then the PDFs of the vendors no longer have to be posted. And just align the two together. Well, I think that's the administrative piece that would fall under the who is responsible for this, that that is their uh, work to figure out uh, because it is complex and it is um, very important. Well, so that, that would be that's why I think system. it's important in this policy to clarify who or uh, what office, if you will, is responsible for this. So a couple of questions that I, I, I heard, and if I've misheard, please feel free to correct me. And Dr. Hager, I see that you have to log off. We will still have a quorum in your absence, I believe, because uh, Ms. Han is still on the, on the line. Uh, so with respect to, um, and I'm sorry, let me recover your questions, Ms. Quasi. Okay, so first um, you asked about uh, other time frames. So uh, if an individual's boards or when an individual's board service or employment ends, that individual must file within 30 days of completion of service or completion of employment a financial disclosure statement. And it's for that period, for that prior year, because the assumption is we might not have gotten it. Uh, that will be required uh, of anyone leaving board service, as I said, or leaving employment. So again, it, it could uh, chop off part of the year, but the intention is that it not, that it goes to the end of that individual's employment, which could or could not track, or might or might not track with the years, uh, with the reporting period for um, a regular financial disclosure statement for that prior year. So that, that's one um, response. Then, uh, or one question, you asked about the retention period. So um, as you're aware, all of the school systems records are um, on records retention schedules approved by the state archivist. I don't remember the number right offhand. I can certainly provide that after this meeting. Uh, but as you're also aware, there's currently a ban. Uh, so nothing's being uh, disposed of by the business services office. So that ban has been in place for um, nigh on three years uh, that nothing's been uh, thrown out. So records or non-records, I should say. So it's it's that is somewhat academic, uh, given that the board still has uh, a ban in place. Uh, with respect to, um, let's see, I don't see another question. Um, unless you were asking about additional language. So those, was there another question, ma'am? Uh, yes, it had been asked uh, by me and um, I believe Ms. Rowe also, how to include clarity of who or which office is responsible for updating and publishing this information. And if you include a specific office and the organization changes, as it just did under the public works recommendations, what I would caution you is that that may very soon or at some point be out of date. I'm satisfied so, with seeing the school system as that leaves it squarely in the hands of the superintendent to decide who under his jurisdiction is responsible for doing that. And then he is responsible to make sure that gets done both as the superintendent and as the secretary treasurer of the board. So then we should just include a statement that the superintendent is responsible for 
timely um, publishing of that info, uh, updating and publishing the information. Would you like to make a motion to that effect and then we can vote on it so we can process this? Um, if that's your preference, sure. I'm not sure there'll be consensus, which is why I'd rather do that part by motion. Other than that, does any besides that specific point, does anyone object to Ms. Howie's language? Can she, can it be put in the chat what her language is? Ms. Rowe? Yes, Ms. Hen. Given the hour, I move to postpone these policies to the next policy committee meeting. Well, let's just wait a couple more minutes because I think that we can probably resolve this as soon as Ms. Howie finishes typing in the language and then we can vote. Okay, so does anyone object to the, for the purposes? Why? Well, there's a, motion, there's a motion on the floor, and I don't feel comfortable moving them forward without further discussion and review. I have several concerns that we're not going to have time to address, and I don't feel comfortable moving them forward. Okay, well, let's have the committee vote then on keeping these on the, the agenda till the next done. PRC meeting. Okay. Um, So do you I'm want to make a motion? my motion in the chat? And I'm well also waiting to see Miss Howie's language in the chat. I understand, but well, Miss Hen's motion. Miss Hen's motion to uh, postpone postpone this to the next policy um, review committee meeting um, would suspend discussion. So let's process that motion. Miss Hen, would you make that motion, please? I move to postpone the ethics policies until the next policy review committee meeting. I'll second that. Um, would you call the roll on that, please? Yes, uh, Ms. Causey. I have a question. Can we, so if we postpone them, postpone them then that prevents future, any discussion in this meeting or no? Yes, it does. It means we get yes. in the meeting and we discuss it more in the next meeting. Yes. Okay. Dr. Hager. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Okay, I have four, four yeses. Okay, the motion carries. So item 2E, Ethic po Code Policies, New Comar, will be um, postponed to the next PRC meeting. And so um, item five, the next meeting of the Policy Review Committee is scheduled for Monday, September 19th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, committee members, and thank you, Ms. Wash and Ms. Glazer. Thank, thank you, Ms. Howie. Thank you all. Thank you, com committee members. We moved through thank a lot you. today.